Welcome to the High Value Sales Show of Eversprint.com. I'm Malcolm Louie, the managing member of Eversprint, and today we're speaking with Jason Forrest, the CEO of Forrest Performance Group, a provider of sales, management, and corporate training programs. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks, Malcolm. I'm glad to be here. Jason, you grew your company's revenue from 1.9 million in 2014 to 3.4 million in 2017, an 81% increase. Before we talk about how you grew your company so fast, can you briefly share what your company does beyond my quick intro and how your company differs from the competition? Yeah, so, so when I started my company 10 years ago, my whole concept was I wanted to redefine training. So if you actually look up the definition of training, it's to change behavior. But what I recognize is that majority of companies out there, they don't have, um, you know, they, they can't change behavior. There's no, there's no proof to it. So actually about 164 billion is spent every year on training, but 70% fails to reach its ROI. So that's, that was really our focus. And we do that really in five, uh, five different ways. So one, uh, we believe in teaching the tactical how to approach to sell. So most people teach kind of what to do or why to do it, but they don't also teach how to do it. So people leave kind of wondering, you know, what to do next. Uh, number two is we're very beliefs based. So we teach the, the psychology uh, that reinforces the concepts. What happens with selling is it takes a lot of courage and there's a lot of like mental blocks that get in the way. And so we, we focus a lot on the psychology. And then number three is we believe in sales management coaching. So teaching coaches like managers how to be sales coaches and, and work their people like athletes. And then number four is everything we do is program based. So instead of the one day event, you kind of fly and learn some concepts. Everything is program based. It's ongoing it's experiential learning. And then last, number five, is culture. So we're all about how do we create uh, cultures that can reinforce these concepts even after we're gone. All right. Now, you grew your company quite rapidly, 1.9 million to 2014. You almost doubled it in 2017 to 3.4 million. What were the three biggest drivers of that growth? That's a great question. So I would say the first thing is just being really clear on on how we're different. And so those five things that that's, you know, that's really, that's how we're different. That's our, our brand strategy that we really focus on. And then I would say the second thing is I'm very big on creating best place to work environments. You know, I, I think the, one of the struggles that organizations have is they're, they're really seeking that fast growth, but they don't create a best place to work environment. And so because of that, they have high turnover. And if you have high turnover, it, you can never really scale fast because you end up having to constantly retrain your people. And so we're really big on, on creating that. We've actually won the best place to work in Fort Worth for several years now and best place to work in Texas and a different place. And so that's a big focus for us is that culture, internal, uh, internal culture piece. And then I would say, you know, the third thing that we're always focused on is just, you know, practicing what we preach. So one of the things that we believe in is you got to eat your own dog food. So meaning anything that we tell our clients to do first, we vet it internally. So, you know, I teach all the concepts first to my own employees and to make sure that they work. And if they work, we can teach them to other people and sell them, which is really different. And it sounds surprising, but it's very surprising and different in the industry of consulting. A lot of uh, consulting companies are actually run very poorly. They actually don't uh, live by their own things that they teach. And so that was a big, a big focus for, for us. All right. So the, the drivers in are number one, uh, being really clear on how uh, you are different from the competition and what you offer. Uh, number two, creating an environment that's just a fantastic place to work. So you retain people and then you're not spending time rehiring and it allows you to scale. And last one is practicing what you preach. You make sure that everything that you teach your clients, you make sure they work first internally before sharing it with others. Yeah, and that, that third, the third thing is, it's an interesting concept because you know I'm a big fan that you have to sell yourself on kind of what you do and who you are before you can sell anyone else sell anyone else. And, you know, and, and, and so, I mean, all of our employees, I mean, they're extreme advocates for what we do and who we are. I mean, they're, they really are advocates and that's because they, they don't just, you know, work for a company that sells training. They, they are a part of a company that trains them in the same ways that they are, you know, they're, they're selling. So they, they become believers of what we do and who we are. Now in your sales training, I imagine you probably also uh, recommend that, that your clients and, the, and their sales process be really clear on what they are doing and how they are different. How do you help them with that? 
Uh, that's a great question. So <clears throat> one of the things that we have is what's called the brand strategy. And there's there's really three elements to a brand strategy. So the first is, is what are you sought after for? So meaning that what would people, you know, if you had some keywords out there and, and, and people were to kind of pull you in and say, hey, this is what this company is known for, what would that be? So for us, it's it's programs. So it's training programs that truly change behavior and you know, or a part of the company's strategy. So they, versus a lot of companies, you know, they, they, they hire training to kind of check it off a box with us. It's, it's actually part of one of their key initiatives for the year or for the decade of how they're going to get to where they need to go. So we're sought after from that partner perspective, but the, the second level down is, is what do you want to be uh, preferred by? So preferred means, um, if, 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 you know, kind of two companies are doing the same things, then why would one company kind of prefer you over other? So like think of like Coke versus Pepsi, you know, they both do the same thing, uh, but one prefers, you know, one over the other. And so like in our case, we, we want to be preferred uh, based upon our relevancy. So being really relevant to our client, um, keeping the training videos updated, keeping them focused and clear. A lot of, a lot of training videos and, and content was created 10 years ago and they don't update it. So we are constantly uh, on an annual basis updating our material to make sure it's timely for the market. And then the last level is, I call the table stakes, but we would also call it uh, competitive. So competitive means what's, what's the, what's expected, you know, meaning what's the expected table stakes that a company just expects you to have and you better do right. They're not going to hire you because of it, but they're going to fire you if you don't do it right. And so in our case, our expected uh, area, our, our table stakes are the customer intimacy. So just being aligned with the customer and making sure that we're all on the same page. And the second is operational excellence. So just making sure that the materials are there on time and you know all the customer experience stuff is, is right. So again, I can't win any sales based on operational excellence or customer intimacy because it's expected, but you can definitely lose business um, if you don't get those things right. So I would say, again, if a company wants to have that clarity, then again, they, they, they break into three chunks, right? So the very, what's, what are they searching for? So like Jim Collins would call this, you know, your hedgehog concept, right? So what do you want to be sought after for? And then the next level down is what do you want to be preferred for? And then the last is what are your table stakes? What is your ex- expected areas that you got to get right, but um, is a foundation. How quickly do you find that your clients can actually execute these three uh, pillars? Well, I would say most organizations we start with don't even have, haven't even thought about it at all. I mean, they, they, mm-hmm. they've never, they've never done even, you know, the work at all to figure out what, you know, what, what do they want to be sought after for and preferred and expected? And, and a lot of them get it kind of messed up when you first start. So they'll, they'll say something like, well, we want to be known for operational excellence or customer experience and be sought after for that. Well, in their industry, it doesn't really work because again, it's expected, but it's not, it's not something people sought after for. So like, think about like buying a home, right? So let's say you're a home builder and you're trying to create your personal brand around that and what your brand strategy is. Well, most people, when they're looking for a home, they're not thinking about, you know, who has the best customer service. That's not what they think about when it comes to home. They're thinking about, they're thinking about design. They're thinking about location. They're thinking about amenities and features. There's, you know, there's, they're thinking about other things than they are. So, so that would be an example of, you know, sometimes they go down the wrong path. You know, they're, they might say something like quality. We want to be known as a quality and have high quality and standards. Again, you know, no one seeks out that when they're looking for home they just expect it to have great quality right for your second driver creating a best place to work how do you do that well so this this was really interesting so you know i woke up one day when i was really growing my company at the very beginning um you know i went from myself so i mean i I was able to do 1.2 million just by myself and an assistant so um and so when i wanted to really grow i had to bring on a lot of people and so I was very fearful of that in the sense that, or, you know, again, another Jim Collins quote, he would say, you, you know, great leaders are productively paranoid. So, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and a lot of the great leaders out there, they're productively paranoid in the sense of, you know, here's what I want to move towards when I'm paranoid, there's going to be mess ups along the way. And so, or another version of that would be optimistically cautious, you know? And so, so I, I, um, I wanted to make sure that everyone in my company, you know, believed what I believed. And so whenever you go from, you know, a sole entrepreneur to a company owner, the idea is that, you know, the biggest concern people have is, well, I'm not going to get Jason anymore. I'm going to get these other people. 
And are they going to take this as seriously as he is? And they, they can they get concerned about that. So, so my whole goal was how do I create a company where they can have any of my trainers or consultants and it, they don't feel like they're getting a less than or they're let down or it's not as good. And so, you know, we put a lot of energy towards that. So the, one of my definition of, or my main defin, definition of culture is what happens behind the boss's back. So when you think of culture, people will say, well, a shared, a shared system of beliefs, there's all kinds of definitions out there, but mine is very simple. And that's what happens behind the boss's back is the culture. So it's a if it's the culture you want, then you know with a hundred percent certainty that your, your employees are doing what you would want them to do and act how you'd want them to act is if the boss is right there next to them. That's the culture you want. Obviously the culture you don't want is the opposite of that. Right. And so it's a great question to ask audiences a lot and, and our clients is that, you know, do you have the culture you want and, you know, do you consider yourself to have a productive and profitable culture? And then, you know, a lot of them will say yes. And then you, you ask them that question and they're, they'll say, well, I'm not really for sure, you know, or you ask them another question and like, here's a great one that the cause people to lean in and that's, that's well, you know, so let me ask this question. If, if the, if the boss is uh, going from division to division, division to division, and um, there's, a, is there, is there an email that goes out saying, Hey, the CEO is in town or the COO is in town. So everyone let's get buttoned up and they all laugh. And they go, yeah, we do that. Well, that's the culture you don't want because you're basically saying that you're not performing on a daily basis as if the CEO is there. That's a culture you don't want. So Gallup will actually say that, that, um, that in a 40 hour work week, the average employee is only giving you, only giving you 40% of a 40 hour work week in productivity. So the rest of the time they're not being productive uh, and actually earning what they're being paid. Right. Now, I can see how that creates a very effective environment. But for me, when you talk about being a best place to work, you know, of course, uh, you want your people to, to do the job as if you were there as well. But there's more to that, that to make a company an awesome place to work, right? They, don't, they need to like being there. They need to like the people that they're doing, uh, people that they're working with. They like to, they like to you know, enjoy the work that, that they are doing. So how do you foster that? Uh, great, great question. Uh, so... So I, we do, do everything based upon the six human needs psychology. So it was actually originally created by a guy named Tony Robbins, who, who um, kind of was in a, a new version of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, I have many certifications. I'm a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming. I'm also a, uh, an addiction coach. So learning how to get people off addictions. And so different certifications. But, but in the six human needs psychology, um, the idea is these are all primal needs that people have. And, and so what we do is we focus on how to, how to like, how to create FPG as a place that fulfills each of a person's six human needs. So for example, um, the six human needs are certainty. So how do we get, how do we make FPG a safe place for them to work? You know, safe in the sense of their work environment, who they report to their peers. Uh, how do they also have certainty in the leadership and the direction the company is heading, uh, the financial stability of the company variety is the second one. That's fun. So how to, how to, how can we have fun at work and get, make this place a fun place as well as how can we give them new, new, new opportunities to kind of change up their day so it doesn't get so routine and boring. Uh, number three is significance. So significance is how can they feel like they, they're important? How do they feel like they're, they matter? Their voice is being heard. It's very important. Uh, the fourth is connection. So connection is, you know, do they feel like they're connected to the vision, mission, strategy of the organization? Do they have a, do they have a vital friend at work? Uh, one of the questions we ask on that, which is really fun, we actually do a, a lot of internal surveys and we ask the employees, is there anyone at work that you talk to outside of work? And it's interesting because we've noticed the people who are, are higher engaged with us are ones that actually have friends they've made that they still hang out with outside of work. And so that's really important. The fifth one is growth. So growth is, do I feel like I'm getting better? Do I feel like I'm improving and uh, being challenged? And the last is contribution. Do I feel like I'm making a difference? Do I feel like um, from a, you know, is my, is my contribution connected to what the company's trying to do? Right. So those so are the six. Yep. Yeah. What do you do to foster the uh, connection side of things? Um, we do a lot of things. So, so one of the things that we have in our organization is a, a daily huddle. And so the president of the, of the, of the organization, Mary Marshall, she has a daily huddle with her, um, direct reports, so all the department heads of, of the company. 
And um, and then of course they, then department heads have have huddles right after that with their 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 um, drug reports as well. So, but the purpose of the huddle is several things. It actually fulfills a lot of the six human needs because it gives people certainty because we're all on the same page. But it also gives connection because every morning they start with some sort of connection activity. So they can, they have some sort of like question they ask um, that kind of helps people get to know each other better. So that you know does a lot for people. And then also um, one of the things that we have little little things during the year that we do. So like for example, every quarterly meeting we have uh, different kind of connection type things we do to get to get to, get to eat, know each other better. Uh, we've got weekly assignments that we'll do to, hey, you know, like the six human needs, for example. So that was one we did recently. We talk about that a lot and we'll say, okay, get with someone that you haven't, you know, spent time with before and share, share the ranking order of your six human needs and then learn their six human needs and find the, find the things you have in common with them. So we do that. We also have a thing every year called Love Week. It happens during Valentine's. And it's where um, you basically are randomly paired up, like secretly paired up with like a secret admirer, like a love angel. And that person has to ask questions to get to know who you are without obviously revealing to you who they are. So they have to ask other employees. And then they send you sprinkles. They send you like a, a gift a day and an encouraging letter, encouraging note, something that's, something that's significant to you. How do you get people to hang out after work, outside of work? I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if we make anyone do anything, but we just create the environment for all of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so in the sense that, um, you know, we'll have different things like, Hey, we've got this brewery thing, you know, people are going to, everyone's invited. And so it's, it's more, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's just, it's more about the individual connection. So it's more about creating yeah. that atmosphere where people again, want to hang out, want to be a part of something or be a part, you know, a great question was that was uh, I was I heard a speaker one time that I thought was a really cool concept and that was do you have a culture that your employees would wear a t-shirt with your logo on right which is a cool concept right most companies I mean, I've worked for places in the past when I you know wasn't owning my own company that I wasn't really that proud of the company enough to like wear a logo on a t-shirt like on my day off you know mm, yeah and so and that's a big thing you know and that and so I think you have to be mindful of that and go, how can I create a place? And, and again, my primary driver when I first did it was I, re I recognized that as an entrepreneur, I'm going to spend the majority of my life here. And, and, um, and most employees do I mean, most, most human beings spend the majority of their life in, at work. And so, you know, if that's the case, why don't we do our best to create a place that people want to be at versus have to be at, and they look forward to going to. And, and we do that. I mean, we have, we have, um, you know, we, hi we hire interns all the time. Uh, from the local college, Texas Christian University, TCU. And we, we um, they're constantly, I mean, they work for us for free. They're millennials, work for us for free. And they, they talk about how most places, you know, you, you, you leave work to get away from work so you can go enjoy your life. But we hear most of the time that without soliciting them, they'll say that, that you know, they like to leave life to come to work because they, they like work better than outside of work. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked at some places where, uh, it's fantastic and people enjoy being around each other and both at work and outside of work. And I've worked at other places where it's not quite like that. And, and there, there's, there's some sort of intangible element, right? To, to get that community that goes beyond just doing the business of the company as opposed to being more committed and, and engaged on, on other dimensions that are outside of, of perhaps work. And I uh, haven't quite figured out what that secret sauce is besides perhaps just hiring the right people at the very start. Well, I, I think define again. Step. I would say step, I'm just run, run, rolling off some steps here, but I would say step one is is you got to define the kind of culture that you want. You know, so that's again, I'm, I'm speaking to leadership right now. So you got to define the kind of culture that you want, and and be very clear on what are the values and the attributes and the characteristics of of that. I'm a big fan of uh, see, hear, feel language. So, you know, what do you want to see when people walk in? Uh, what do you want to hear people say about you know about the organization? And how do you want to feel, you know, when you're in the room with people? And, and so just, you know, I think going through those exercises like that kind of creates that compelling vision. And then, and then to your point, it would be hiring people who are on board with that compelling vision and, and, and then create an accountability around, you know, we're not going to get away from the standard. So like in our company, we have people really love the, you know, the, the right people. I mean, I, this is what I always tell people is that, that, you know, you're, 
the, your culture might not be right. So a best, a best place to work culture doesn't mean it's the best place to work for everyone. It just means it's the best place to work for the people that want to be at your culture. And so we have a place. I mean, I'm, I would assume a lot of people would hate working for us because, because of the daily huddles and because of, I mean, every, every week, every Monday I address, you know, the company and I have a, what's called a Monday mission meeting. It's 30 minutes stand up huddle and it's our stand up meeting. And it's where I give them some sort of assignment that I'm wanting them to do from a beliefs perspective, a psychology perspective, connection perspective, something. And, and then they have to go and do it. And then they come back the next Monday and they report what they learned and how they grew. And no one ever misses that. No one ever is late to that. No one ever, you know, they, it's their, it's what they want. It's what, it's what they're a part of. But I think a lot of people would, would rather say, you know, I want to be left alone. I don't want to, I don't want to be a part of that. I just want to work and get paid and leave. Right. Got it. But not us, not, not this company. They, they wouldn't last year. Right. Uh, and it's a good, right? I mean, if, there's probably a better place somewhere else for them where they can thrive much more so. Yeah, sure. Of course. So, For your third driver, you talk about practicing what you preach, uh, vetting things internally first. Any things that you've tried internally that was a complete disaster, although it seemed that like very uh, hopeful at the very beginning that you can share with us? Oh, man. Great question. Um, I mean, I would say... Try not to be too general here. I feel like everything we've done, not everything, I think a lot of things that we do don't work in the initial version of them. Um, but we end up finding ways to make them work. So let me give you an example of one that was maybe a little bit tougher in the beginning. So, so one idea I had one time, I was a part of this mastermind group called Entrepreneurs Organization. Are you familiar with it? Yes. Uh, a okay. number of my guests are members as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things you do in EO is called lifelines and it's where you spend 15 minutes sharing your highs and lows of your life and being pretty vulnerable about that. And so, so, um, you know, the first time I rolled it out, I, I probably just didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't roll it out with probably the right expectations and I'm not really sure if my culture was ready for that yet. And so there was some, kind of internal politics and some people that didn't really like each other and just had some struggles that I don't think it really helped. I think it almost in some cases maybe hurt even more the relationship. They weren't, they were on the same page and weren't ready to do that. So they shared, but it was almost like it was used against them. It wasn't used to understand them more and to get them more into, because the purpose of lifelines is to create empathy and go, okay, you know, I, I, I understand more of how you see the world. I mean, each human being wakes up every day with a different pair of glasses on, you know, and they see the world through that pair of glasses. And, you know, we can create a better place if we, you know, start to begin the journey of understanding how, like in your case, you know, Malcolm, you have, you know, a lifetime of experiences. And so, you know, if, if, if I say the word food, like, for example, if I say the word food, what do you think of? Barbecue. So if I, so if I say, if, yeah, so, I, so, you, so as soon as, you know, if I, I hear, um, I hear resources, I hear health. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, if I say the word, um, if I say the word candy to you, what do you say? What do you hear? Candy. <laughs> I just see an image of a peppermint candy when you said that. Okay. So I hear, I hear, I hear my kids, uh, annoyingly asking me for candy constantly and how much I don't want to give them candy anymore. <laughs> you know, okay. So. So it's just an example of, you know, we all have these maps, these filters uh, based on our programming. And if you can start to really understand, you know, that, then you, start, you can start to empathize with them and kind of respect people, you know. So, for example, let's say you have a very positive relationship with candy, just in, in theory, a positive relationship with candy, you think it's great. And, um, but I have a negative relationship with candy. Well, you know, you might immediately judge me when I am kind of, you know, I don't want candy. I don't want, I don't want to eat that. Right. And you're probably wondering, gosh, why is he so like jerkish about, the, about like being offered candy? Why is he so rude about candy? You know? And, and I'm not rude about it. I just, <clears throat> I have such a, such a negative programming to it that my automatic response is, I don't want that in my life, you know? Yeah. And so, so it's just, it's just knowing people better. So again, in that example, I just, I just didn't probably uh, set the stage well enough for that. I mean, my culture would be something that I could, I could probably do it now. I haven't done it since then, but I could probably do it now and it'd probably be received a lot better and it wouldn't be used against them in a court of law, but, but now, <laughs> right. it was probably a little too premature. Yeah. 
you know, it requires people to open up a bit, right? And they need to be in an environment where they trust, like you said, that whatever they share won't be potentially used against them down the line. Exactly. Looking a bit ahead for 2019, uh, what growth targets can you share for us? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure I can tell you 2019. I, mean, I can tell you that my our goal is to create a $100 million training company. I mean, that is, okay. our, that is our goal. Okay. Uh, we, are, we are many millions away from that target, but we do have a, um, we do have an annual goal to grow um, at a, a minimum of 30% a year, but ideally 50% a year. So 30 to 30 is kind of our minimum and 50% is our ideal growth rate that we believe if we can, if we can sustain that growth, then we can um, handle it from an operational perspective because you know, obviously if you grow too slow, then you get left behind. If you grow too fast, then you have a lot of operational errors. So yep. that, that seems to be the number that we feel we can sustain. Right. And let's just uh, be ambitious here. Let's say you're shooting for 50% growth this year. Uh, what do you need to accomplish? What challenges need to be overcome for your team and you to get to that 50% growth rate? You know, great question. So I, I would say just, um, I mean, the, the big thing for us right now is we're, we're constantly expanding into new, uh, new industries and new markets. And so in order to grow that fast, you know, you need to be known into new places that they just don't know you. And so, so right now we're just trying to find the right, the right marketing initiatives uh, to enter into. And we actually do really well. I mean, I would hope we would do really well. Once we actually talk to the customers and we're in that kind of proposal stage and we're, you know, a person's looking for training and we're one of the kind of candidates and we actually do really, really well at converting that. We convert, you know, more than half of those. So we're actually high conversion around those. Um, the hardest thing for us though is just penetrating the, the markets that, you know, we don't even, we don't, we can't even get a conversation at the table. So that's, that's probably our biggest struggle right now. What makes it so difficult to get a conversation, right? I mean, just from our conversation alone, I can see how you, know, you can help instigate change within the organization, uh, just on a few of the dimensions that we just talked about, right? Culture, uh, best place to work, branding, and so on. So, you know, what company wouldn't want to do those sort of things? And, and what makes it difficult for you to engage them and have that first conversation? Uh, great question. So the, the you know, uh, it, what's interesting is, yes, once they start talking to us, they think it's really cool and they're very interested in it in, in the conversation. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, we've, we've struggled to somehow get people to talk to, to, to communicate the message from a marketing perspective where a person feels like we actually would have a solution to win. So remember I, earlier I said that stat, 164 billion spent on training, 70% fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that map. That's that programming that's out there. And so, you know, people just don't, they kind of lump us in with the 70%. So it's, so what we're, what we're trying to do is constantly penetrate and say, no, we're, we're part of that 30%. So one of the things we did actually helped a lot. So I wrote, I wrote a book called WTF, which stands for why training fails, obviously. And, <laughs> right. and uh, yeah. And so we do send that book out a lot. So that actually is it's a little booklet. It takes you less than an hour to read. It's very, a lot of stories, metaphors, examples, stats, and kind of stuff. It's really easy to read. And so, and I also have a, a free audio version of it as well that, you know, we send out to people and uh, people can get a hold of and on our website at fpg.com. And, and so we do things like that to obviously build awareness and, and to start the conversation. But, you know, I don't know. I, def, I definitely, I mean, maybe you have some insights for me, but we definitely haven't cracked the code to get in front of the people. If we can, like I said, if we can get in front of them, then we have a very compelling message to tell them and we can show them how we're a better use of their resources than, you know, the other companies they're considering, but it's just getting in front of them is the tough part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember uh, for, for uh, one of the companies I work for, uh, you know, perhaps in perhaps this is their culture, right? They, they left their people mostly on their own to, uh, to, uh, learn and figure out how to do things the right way and the best way, as opposed to offering some formal training from a outside consultant or, or training company to help with that. So I guess there might be some cultural issues you might need to tackle as well to, to break through, I would imagine. Yeah. Well that, and that well, the culture issue is the problem. Once you start, you know, once you start, I mean, we, 
we, um, you know, we have a client now that, you know, they've, they've had employees there for 30 something years. And they've been doing it the same way for 30 years and we've had a lot of, you know, acquisitions along the way and mergers. And, and so they're now just trying to kind of unravel all of that and get everyone on the same page of a new CEO. And, and so, and so, yeah, it's tough. I mean, the, fortunately in that case, the CEO is very determined to make some needed adjustments, but there's a lot of, again, that programming, a lot of maps and filters that have been kind of established and norms that have been established in silos and, and all of that needs to kind of move in a different direction. Right. Now you talked about the 70% of the training fails. I mean, I've gone to my share of uh, seminars and workshops. I've read my share of books and, and I, I don't even know if, if I've applied even 30% of, uh, of my attendance of those things and commitment and time spent reading and, and studying and learning. Uh, what do you think is the story behind that? Why, why aren't people getting more out of their training, more out of their own self-education? Yeah. So, so I, I developed a formula called uh, that I've tr recently trademarked and it's performance equals knowledge minus leashes. Okay. So P equals K minus L performance equals knowledge minus leashes. Really simple. Once you get it to be 10 years to create this, but I think it'll make a lot of sense. So performance is what we see a person do. So let's go back to, you know, let's say we, they go to a seminar on learning the six steps to negotiate proper when it comes to contracts, right? Always an important skill. And that's the knowledge. Well, ideally they would use those six steps every time they're in a negotiating situation, which would be the performance side. We would see them do that and they would have success doing it. Well, you have to minus out the leashes and the leashes are any resistance that prevents them from using those six steps 100% of the time. And there are four types of leashes. The four types are one, the self-image. So self-image is, I just don't see myself doing that. I don't see myself as a good negotiator, like in that case, that's the way they describe themselves. Number two would be reluctances. Reluctances are in, in situational fears. Well, I would use this, these six steps when I'm talking to you know, um, a person at my level, but when you're talking to a person that's three, de three degrees higher than me or has a higher intellect, I don't feel as comfortable or friends and family, I don't, I don't feel as comfortable. So certain situations, I don't feel as comfortable using these concepts. That's number two. Number three is the rules. So rules are, think of like rules of engagement. So it's the if onlys, you know, so I will use these six steps if only the following conditions are met. If only, you know, I've, I've spent several hours with the customer. If only I've you know, talk to them multiple times. If only the decision makers are all present. Um, I, I heard one recently from a salesperson that said they were taught from a previous sales trainer that before you submit a proposal, make sure that you have relationships with three people at three different levels. So some, you know, at the functional level, at the middle management level, at the CEO. So that's a, that's a rule, you know, well, so they, they won't even do the six steps until they accomplish that role. And the last one is a story. So a story is external. So the, that would be like, well, the economy is not good right now, or the market's not good. Or the reason why I'm not applying this is because, you know, the timing's not right. These are kind of stories they create. Um, and so those are the four types of leashes. And so, you know, it's just a, look at think of it from like a math formula, right? So you have, let's say you've got a veteran, a veteran employee who's got a 10 on knowledge. Um, you can see them do it. They've done it in the past. They know how to do it. They would pass the test. They got it. Um, but they've got a nine on leashes. And so their performance is one. They do it one out of 10 times versus a newbie goes to class, learns it, has zero leashes. And so and let's say they've got a knowledge level of a two. Well, two minus, you know, zero is two, right? So, which is a lot of times why you, you, would, you would call it kind of beginner's luck. Like that's kind of the, the, the urban term for what I'm describing. but but the reason why they have beginner's luck is because they've learned something, they did it, and it almost surprised themselves that it worked. But it, but it, but very quickly they start hearing, making up their own stories, or hearing alibis and leashes from other people, and they they you know kind of adopt those themselves. Right. So you 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 wrote a book, your uh, Why Training Fails, your WTF book, great title by the way, and you uh, came up with your this concept of a P equals K minus L. And it's cool. I mean, I, from what you describe, those some really interesting topics. Sounds like there's probably some stuff I can learn from from uh, 
uh, reading up on the content that you have on those things. How do you come up with these ideas? Um, I would, um, ah, great question. You know, I think as an entrepreneur, I mean, some reason, you know, I've been, I've just been gifted with seeing the problems and things and kind of frustrated and, um, you know, my, my best way is probably just solving my own problems or, you know, as a, as a teacher myself trying to, or a coach trying to get a person unstuck or explain something and just having a extreme kind of frustration of, you know, why is, why is this person not succeeding in this area and how do I get them to succeed more and what's stopping them, what's preventing them, what's keeping them. And just, you know, constantly kind of being obsessed with trying to figure out, you know, the, the answers to it. And so from that, it's helped me create a ton of models. I mean, we've, got, we've got all kinds of models that we obviously sell and have IP around that kind of explain things to people. And, and that's really the goal. I mean, I think that the goal is, you know, how, how do we just make things simpler for people so that they can have the awareness and have the resources to be successful? One of my core beliefs, and I think if anyone gets anything out of today, this will be the thing I would want them to get. And that is kind of two things. One is that people are always doing the best they can with the resources they have. Okay. So the internal, whatever re internal resources they have, they're doing the best they can. Number two is, is that positive change always comes from adding more resources. So just those are the two. And so if you look at the human race going forward, when someone's succeeding or failing, and you immediately look at that map of the world and you go, okay, well, they're doing the best they can with the resources they have at whatever level that is. And then number two is, but if you gave more resources, they would do better. And so that's, you know, that's just kind of how we look at the, we look at life. Right. I look at life. What about making better use of your existing resources? How would that fit into these two <clears throat> core beliefs? Well, it's a great question. So um, I think a lot of people, they don't, they don't have enough awareness of their existing resources. So they feel like they're, so like, let me give you an example. So yesterday I was coaching an executive, I had a big seminar yesterday with, you know, about, I don't know, about 50, 60 executives from a $4 billion company. And, and I took this one through an exercise where he said, you know, I don't feel like I have enough structure to be a coach. And, and, you know, so I asked, I took him through a coaching, coaching process on that. And, and, um, and then I started, I started asking him a series of questions. I said, well, what, what, do you, what do you do currently that's working? And he said, <clears throat> we teach him huddles and stuff. He said, well, I do huddles. And I said, great, so do the huddles work? And he says, sometimes. I said, well, okay, well, how often do you do that? And he told me. I said, well, what, what, what parts of them do work? And he told me. And then I said, what would be the ideal time to do it? He told me. I said, well, do you coach your people? He said, yes. I said, well, how do you coach them? He said, well, I follow the process you taught. And I said, all the time? He said, no, sometimes. And I said, well, what would happen if you followed all the time? I said, well, I'd be more effective. So I just kept, what I kept doing is every time he was stuck, I kept going back to what is he already doing sometimes and, what's, and what would happen if he did it all the time? And so, you know, by the exercise, by the time this exercise was over, I had to realize that he had actually all the resources he needed inside of him to be successful at that moment with the task at hand. So not all the time you have the resources you need, but at that, in that situation, he had enough resources in order to get unstuck with this leash that he had, which was, I don't have enough structure to be a world-class coach. And, but through the exercise, he realized he actually had all the structure he needed. He just hadn't cataloged it correctly in his brain and he hadn't organized it in a way that he could use it, you know, going forward, which is why I did for him. Right. Uh, when I was talking to you about a re, uh, what I had in mind when I was, asking about people making better use of the resources. The one that came to my mind, and perhaps I find it a resource that I have that I'm not utilizing best is time. Uh, what's the best advice you give your clients in regards to making the most of their time? Uh, okay, so this is a great question. So I would say number one, number one would be, what is your primary question? So in life, in business, everyone has a kind of lives by a primary question. They just don't realize what, they, what the question is. So. So for example, let's say if you are a COO, a, 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 you know, a, a, in charge of operations, it would be, how do I increase the speed and profitability of my organization today? That would be your primary question. If it's me as a CEO, it's how can I be leading edge today? So how can I push the company even further today and expand the horizons? If you're sales, it's how can I 
move the sale forward today. If you're a sales manager, it's how can I coach a sale forward today? If you're marketing, it's how can I bring in one more lead today? You know, so it's, it's, it's being really clear on what is your primary question as it relates to your individual role. I think that's really, really, really important. And then, and then, and then say, okay, well, I'm going to operate off this primary question and say, okay, what, what's the first thing I need to do tomorrow? What's the second thing I need to do? What are, what are the two, three, four things that I need to do that would help me fulfill my primary question tomorrow? And I think that planning needs to happen the night before, not the day of, because you'll be in kind of reactive mode. And then you want to create some non-negotiables around it. So, you know, maybe three or four is too many. Maybe it's just one. But the idea is have that accountability to, with yourself and, and, and if you can, with other people that say, you know, no matter what fires come tomorrow, no matter what reacting comes tomorrow, no matter what things, the urgent things that come up, this is the one thing I have to do tomorrow to make sure my primary question is being fulfilled. And so just make that like your own personal commitment with yourself and others, um, as well as that night before planning, live by your primary question. All those things would be the first things out of my mouth, I would say, without going into much more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes sense, right? I mean, you, you make progress on your one thing, right? Uh, it's a very, it's a very popular Ted talk, right? The one thing in the right. book as well. And you just make steady progress on that. And then you have big impact at the end of the year or yeah, that's right. Uh, multiple years later. I had a question for you when we were talking about marketing. Um, and then we, we uh, started talking about some other topics that, that came off that discussion as well, but maybe I can bring you back to that a little bit. Um, you talk about, uh, doing a bit of marketing, trying to figure out that puzzle, the challenge of connecting with your ideal clients and getting them engaged because you have a fantastic product and service. It's a matter of you know, letting them be aware of it. I took a bit of, I took a look at your online marketing activities and from my tools, it looks like you're doing a little bit of pay-per-click advertising. Um, but from an SEO perspective, it doesn't seem like you're making a huge investment on that front, at least from the tools that I have. What's your take on that? Um, it's a great question. I, again, I, I, I don't know. I, I've had so many different competing uh, perspectives on that. We, we've, um, you know, we, we actually were much higher in ranking at one time. Uh, we did pull resources from that and did more kind of guerrilla warfare type marketing strategies that seemed to do better for us. Uh, but I, I don't know. I'm on the fence with that because, you know, I, I do feel like there's, obviously value in, in having a higher SEO ranking. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if that's just for my own ego or if that's, that really matters anymore. You know, I, I just don't know. I struggle sometimes with wondering, you know, like even myself, and I don't know if I'm the right person to, to judge, but you know, when I'm looking for something, you know, I usually ask people that I know what they would recommend before I just do a search for it. So I don't, I don't do a lot of searches on Google going, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever thing I'm trying to define, I, I don't, I don't, for some reason, I don't, I don't use it as often, you know? So, um, again, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, 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 I personally think that we should put more money towards it, but the, you know, other people we've counseled said that they should, we should put more money towards other things and there's just not enough money to go around. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it goes back to, uh, utilizing your resources in the best possible manner. Right. So, yeah. Probably uh, go back to your primary question to figure out the best way to go. So. But what is your perspective on that? I mean, do you, do you feel like people still, like if they're looking for, you know, some big corporations looking for an internal sales training program, do you think they go to, think they go to Google and type in sales training? I think, they, I think some might, right? Maybe not all of them, but I think some will, right? If you're tasked with improving uh, your team's sales performance and you're giving a budget to uh, bring in a, a outside consultant or, or training team to help with that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you, you, you will perhaps ask your peers and colleagues and other people in your company who have hired other firms that have done well. And, and you probably would also type in a search and find others as well. Yeah. So I think it's a good avenue. Um, I haven't done the research to see if your competitors are uh, using pay-per-click ads, but I imagine they are. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a good avenue to find people who want a solution right now at this very moment. Right. So, but I think it might not be the best solution for you in your particular case. Right? There's so many different ways to engage people. Uh, pay-per-click ads are one way. Um, you know, LinkedIn's another snail mail, cold emails, cold calling, uh, television advertisement, right? There's so many different channels. It's just a matter of getting in front of the, uh, the people you want to get in front of and, and using the medium where they are. Mm -hmm. All right. So different people have uh, different choices of where they hang out. 
In fact, for one company uh, that I interviewed, my first interview, in fact, uh, they found that AM radio was a fantastic way to get in front of wow. their ideal clients. Yeah, not what I expected, but they generate a huge amount of new business from their own AM radio show because their ideal client still listens to AM radio. So it's quite a surprise, surprising uh, uh, insight that they shared. So. Three last questions for you. Uh, question number one, if you had a billboard, what would your billboard message be? And keep in mind that most people only have six seconds before they drive by a billboard. So what's your message? Um, I don't know. One, one comes up with, again, I'm thinking billboard stuff. So, you know, change your beliefs, change your life. Um, I do like that. Change your beliefs, change your life. You can coach one, coach everyone. Why training fails? No, oh, it's a great question. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna work on that one. Yeah, well, I have to say your uh, your your WTF title is awesome. <laughs> you know? oh, thank you. <laughs> so that's good. Now, which which came first, the uh, why training fails or the WTF? And you, you found the words that could fit. Oh my God, that's a great. Yeah, you know, I think. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It might. It might have been just kind of the same time. You know, it might have been just. Or I might. Have, you know what? I, pro I probably. I probably saw WTF, and immediately I just thought, "Why train fail?" I mean, I, I probably just. Saw, I'm sure I saw the logo and just got excited about, about, about that. Yeah, I mean, that, even that can be a great billboard message, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 provocative. What's funny about it? It's it's provocative enough, which is great. That a lot of people have such a map. We talked about those maps before. They have such a, yeah. a negative programming to that that label that. I've had people say that they, you know, they were mad at me for writing the books. They can't read it because they can't have it in their possession. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, That's... people need to lighten up a little bit, right? Yeah, definitely. But what's good about it is that it, it, people have these negative connotations to it, but then they get surprised when it's totally different, right? Yeah. And you have their attention and then make them think a bit about it. Uh, final two questions. Who are your ideal clients and what's the best way for them to reach you and your team? So... Our ideal client are clients who want to bring in sales training as, again, part of their strategy, that it's a commitment to them from the, the top down, that it's, a, it's something that they know will move the needle for them, and it, they're going to take it seriously. That's our, our ideal client. Uh, and they can find us at fpg.com, stands for Forest Performance Group, fpg.com, and we also we also have a uh, really great way to get to know us. I have a new book coming out coming out called the the uh, the mindset of a warrior of a sales warrior. The mindset of a sales warrior, and it's forty three strategies on getting rid of those leashes, those performance eagles, knowledge, knowledge minus leashes. So letting go of that resistance and the strategies on how to do that. All of my coaching I've done around that, and we have a master class where we teach it right now in a very a very uh, uh, you know just on a monthly basis. And it's uh, fpgmasterclass.com, and they can come in there and sign up, you know, for the masterclass. And it's where they'll we'll go through the strategies live, but then also they can have recordings of it too. And I also do coaching on there, so uh, we have people that opt in for to be coached by me for 15 minutes of it, and, and we use that as a case study to help uh, other people learn from it. Very cool. Now, the FPG masterclass is this a a free uh, class that you at, that you provide? So, so those that are interested can raise their hand and talk to you further about your other programs or is this a paid program right off the bat? It is a paid program right off the bat, but it's the only program that I actually personally do. So all of my, all of our clients and stuff, they're, they're, you know, with my other trainers. And so it's the thing that I do, but I will tell you, it's very, very affordable. I mean, you're only talking, you know, hundred something bucks a month for a person. And, um, but then, you know, and it gets even less than that if companies end up signing, you know, multiple people on the same time, you know, to be a part of the group. So. Right. Now, do you ever uh, fire clients for the ones that you, they, they bring you on board, they, you, you go through the training, you, you help them as much as you possibly can, but for whatever reason, uh, whatever their leashes are, they just don't implement and execute. So they're, so they're in the 70%. Uh, great question. So we, we, what we do is we, we do, I would say about, about once a year ish, I would say there's probably one client that, that we agree that we don't work together. So meaning that, um, yes, I guess you could say that we fire them. It does, it does say in our contract. So uh, majority of our contracts, if they're in the full fledged program are actually month to month. We're the only, 
training company that actually does month to month contracts normally has a 12 month agreement. And we just believe that it, if, if, if the program's not working and you know, we shouldn't stay on just because of that. So we want to have that accountability. If you're in the full program, if you're not in the full program, then we can't guarantee the success. So we do ask for a, a longer commitment for that. But, uh, but it does say in the contract that, you know, we can fire them or they can fire us, um, you know, any month. Yeah. And it makes sense too, right? If, if they're not willing to go ahead and commit and take action on what you're helping them, it's like, it's, it's really not in their, in their best interest to continue in my opinion. Well, you know, and I just thought of my, my billboard. So what, one of the things that we tell people is that our brand is we really want to become or no, be known for the cross fit of sales training, the cross fit uh -huh. of sales training. So we say that a lot. So that's probably, probably the, the right billboard there. Uh, but, and so to your point, a lot of people, they don't, they don't know what they're getting themselves into. Like they, they like, Oh, I could probably do that. That sounds great. But it's such an intense program that we really want to turn you into sales warriors and make your sales teams very disciplined and your managers very accountable and all that needs to happen. And so a lot of it's just too much for their culture to handle. And they're just not, they're not, they, you know, not everyone can be Nick Saban. Not everyone can be Pete Carroll or Bill Belichick or, you know, these world power, you know, these, these strong coaches. I mean, they just don't, a lot of them just don't have the, the grit for it. Yeah. It takes time. It's not, it's not, it's not a overnight sort of thing. No doubt, no doubt about that. That's right. Jason, it's been awesome having you on my show today. I really enjoyed hearing how you grew your company so fast and as well as the insights you shared about sales and leadership and culture building. Thank you. I've enjoyed it as well. I look forward to, to sharing it with the audience. We've been speaking with Jason Forrest, the CEO of Forrest Performance Group, about his company's rapid growth. For interviews with other fast-growing, high-value sales companies, or to learn how we can accelerate your firm's high-value sales through automation, visit Eversprint.com.